Hey, deserving listeners. A lot of you have been asking me over the past couple months, where is Rebecca? Well, let's address that question by having Rebecca on the show to, to talk about where the hell she has been. Rebecca, <laughs> welcome to the podcast. It's so good to be back. This is like, feel is like being normal just for a minute. <laughs> so um, I have some questions on Facebook. I asked people mm -hmm. on Facebook to submit some questions for you. But I think the most important question is from Bellas, who says, how's it going, Rebecca? Oi. Oh, Bellas, thanks for asking. This, these are trying times. <laughs> It's, it's not easy. It's not easy to balance converting your business. It's not easy to parent a teen who's lost everything they care about. It's not easy to support your partner who's also trying to convert their business completely online. And that's, and we're all healthy and we've got housing and food and none of us work in direct line healthcare. <laughs> or in a factory, or have to get in our cars and bring meals to people. So, yeah, it's heavy. It's real. Ed had a question specifically about uh, your son, who has ADHD. He says, as a, as a family uh, with a son with ADHD, how are you coping with this quarantine <laughs> situation? It's really, really hard. Really. So the best advice I got was from my friend, who works in um, older, uh, young adult special education. And she said, uh, make a post, put, have a note every day that's got four things on it. And just hope that those four things get done. And they can be really simple, like brush your teeth um, and go out for a bike ride. So that was working great for a while. But we just got, we, we live in Seattle and uh, schooling just started up this week. And it's amazing if you have, if you spend any time with ADHD folks, you know, like what a transition that most people could kind of roll with and figure out for someone with ADHD. It's like, as if you stranded them on a foreign planet. So with the online education of Seattle public schools and, you know, no one knows what they're doing and the spaces are chaotic online. Um, this week has been really, really hard, and we had a complete meltdown as a family last night, as I'm sure many families have through this process. Yeah, by starting up, you mean you just ended spring break this week? Is that what you mean? Kind of technically. I mean, what's funny is, like, you know, no one knew what was coming. <laughs> I mean, that's been the hardest part of all this, is, like, you kind of put the best plan in place that you can. So we'd kind of... I learned a new term. It's called unschooling. And it's when a kid ends their traditional schooling, usually because of something traumatic, uh, the parents just lay off for a while and let the kid figure out what they want to do. And so that's what we've been doing. And my son finally kind of put together his plan of what he, how he wanted to spend his time and found lectures that he wanted to listen to online and stuff that he thought it was interesting. And so we, like, we kind of had a dreamy two days and then Seattle public schools announced like get back online kids. And so I think he's going through his own grieving process of um, what he, he had, he had his own coping strategy. He had a plan and now he has to go back to school. So not only is he, you know, he's lost everything he loves. He can't see his girlfriend. He can't do the sport that he was just getting into that he really, really loved. He can't socialize with his friends, really. Um, but now he has to go back to school and do it their way. Blech. Yeah, we did an episode about unschooling kind of recently. Oh. And um, I, I don't know a ton about it, but um, some people wrote in about it. And it is true that for some people, they do find themselves in unschooling scenarios because of difficulties. But some parents just decide to do that right from the start because they believe in the philosophy of having a child be free and not be constantly told what to do at school. An ADHD child, for example, would perhaps do better in an unschooling environment, depending. But it puts a tremendous amount of burden on the parents to uh, be there, you know, 24 seven, essentially, um, to help. Um, but it does make some sense, right? You know, kids learning things that they want to learn. And research shows that 
it has the same sort of bell curve as as regular school um, in that some kids do average and some, you know, in terms of later college career, that kind of thing. Um, So was that interesting? I mean, was that good? Could you see yourself doing that uh, in the long term? I think it was the best case scenario for our family right now was to let him have the freedom of what time of day he did his work, who he learned it from. Like it was kind of, it just made a lot of sense. Like if you're grieving everything right now, it it felt like it gave him back some freedom in this crazy scenario that's going to define the rest of his life. You know, I mean, this is, this is his, for me, this is his AIDS epidemic. (laughs) Like, I mean, I can relate to him of like so much loss, so fast, so much confusion. And so, you know, he kind of found his group with it. And now, back in the room full of 30 screaming kids online (laughs) it's a cruel cruel joke so they have classes online like through zoom and stuff is that you're saying yeah yeah there's some microsoft platform that they're learning i mean that's the other hell of this it's like you know there's you have to learn like these eight different platforms some of them are completely not intuitive and then the people who are running the meetings don't know what they're don't know the best way to use them you know, it's like such a joke um you know so is he in school are, right now no La- i have to say this is a lot of disclosure but last night is so bad that we're just calling today T- today is, a, is not a day what happened i don't know just i mean i've heard this from other kids from other parents of teens he was up at three in the morning. He was angry. There was nothing anyone could do. I mean, I've heard this from other friends that their teens are like up at three o'clock in the morning crying. I mean, it's as if they've had a death. It reminds me when I was in high school, within a year, we had two kids die in drug driving accidents. And it, he is acting like I acted then when you're you know you're 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 grieving and no adult in the world can explain can make any sense of what's happening or why this is happening to you and it just feels like your life is over right the time of his life and for many people at that age it's like i want to spend all my time with my friends particularly my girlfriend and now i'm just like completely cut off from that and and we have this notion that well kids today they have snapchat and tiktok and whatever they can communicate with their friends but it's just not the same right and um yeah i can imagine that being very disruptive i wonder if there's an age difference because i i'm talking with a lot of parents with younger kids and the younger kids seem to be at least the anecdote that i'm hearing and i'm guessing research will uh look at this uh, over the next five, 10 years, younger kids that anecdotally seem to be doing a lot better than, than, than that because they're just like, yay, playtime all day. Mommy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but teenagers Mom. are like, uh, more time with my parents? Are you kidding me? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, this is his nightmare and he lets us know every day. And instead of quarantine, we've been calling it quarantine and teens. <laughs> Like, it's just awful for them. How does it feel for you, for you guys? Oh, it feels awful. It just feels, it's heartbreaking. It's hard to watch your child suffer and know that there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, is there nothing we can do? Like, could they meet on the street with 10 feet between them or something? <laughs> sure. Like- and he's, he's had some adventures with that. But, you know, as with everything, like your needs and your family structure has to line up perfectly with that other kid that he would have access to. Like, I mean, it's just hard and, and everything is changing on a dime, right? You know, what felt safe yesterday isn't safe today. Today, do they meet with, but they have masks on, you know, like it's just hard to keep up. And he's had some super fun days, but I think the addition of school getting added in, plus we just heard yesterday that this is going on for another month plus, 
like he just needs time to process that and what do teens do when they're processing but slam doors and you know sleep till three like that's so his thing is he's in a bad mood and he wants you guys to know about it because he's asking for help and empathy he wants his life to go back to normal yeah he's grieving i mean is he angry directly at you guys or oh yeah yeah for what so to put this event in time and space and maybe this is impacting your life animal crossing just came out yeah he would like to play animal crossing all day every day right and then what happens if he didn't do the you know the tiny couple of things that needed to get done and he spent all his time playing animal crossing how do you quote like set limits or punish a kid right now um so taking away that device from him it was as if we removed a limb <laughs> like but you know he there are still some basic boundaries in all of this and it's really hard um and everything feels so magnified oh my god i mean i've, I've been saying to my clients like everybody's just really brittle right now i mean have you thought ah fuck school like you know he's got plenty of time to learn things let's just uh like i guess that's what you did today but are you thinking <laughs> that's like, what i'm doing today like a long term <laughs> like uh, i just um, imagine I like mean, okay it's... let's let's have our priorities here okay <laughs> sanity uh getting out of this alive getting out of this <laughs> with still a relationship and then you know priority number <laughs> 79 is he does his fucking math homework you know <laughs> Well, I think we are re so Seattle Public Schools threw us a monkey wrench, so we have to change the the way that we were parenting. And he is seeing his friends at school. I mean, I think some of this is like societal norms. So we will switch to Seattle Public Schools. He'll do that four hours a day, and the stuff that he was doing at home he'll do less of and we'll have less expectations of him i mean that's what we talked through this morning (laughs) both me and my wife on like three hours of sleep you know we'll see where things sort out at the end of the day um but you know i mean those are the kinds of you know who knows right now what happens if one of his teachers gets deathly ill are there substitutes right now (laughs) i mean it's like there's just a lot of there's a lot more questions than answers right now, for sure. Right. Jesse on Facebook asked, I'm curious about her practice, how her practice mm-hmm. looks different with the social mm-hmm. isolation quarantine measures in place. So I was late to transition to telehealth. Um, I, was, I realized I was really lucky because of the way my office is set up. Um, I could sterilize all the doorknobs and stay six feet away from people up until Jay Inslee, our very good governor uh put the essential business order cap in last thursday was the last day wednesday thursday i'm not sure so time who can remember anymore (laughs) when these things happen so i didn't go full telehealth until last thursday um i had been doing i had offered it to all my clients some clients didn't feel safe to come in so it was like you know, first it was two weeks, then it was, and we were two weeks ahead of the rest of the country in terms of isolating. So, you know, it was like two week, three week, five a week. Um, I found it was really hard to switch back and forth between telehealth and in person. And so I had to tell my clients that wanted telehealth, like I need to kind of move you guys into blocks so I can be like in that telehealth zone, which for me is really different having not been very experienced in it. Um, well, had you ever of, done phone sessions before? I had done a few. I because I hate working that way. I'll be really honest, but I had been doing supervision with Guy Young in South Korea for a couple of years, so I, I have done it. But what's hard is not every client can make the transition. So time out, real life moment. Because I'm stuck at home, my puppy wants to come through the room that I'm in. Yeah, and there might be some noise. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> um, this is not my very good, well-behaved therapy dog. This is my crazy mix, uh, mostly Lhasa Apso Winter, who's a year old and crazy. All right, there he goes. He'll come back and bark some more later. 
welcome to my life right now. Um, okay, so so telehealth. Uh, yeah, so some clients who don't really jive with it are calling in less. Um, I've had, I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's been a tremendous amount of loss, death and loss, not connected to the virus. Have you noticed this with your clients? Well, I don't have that many clients these okay. you know, over the past five, 10 years, uh, but off the top of my head, um, yeah, no, I mean, not any more than usual, I would say. Okay. So I've got tons of clients and friends who have folks dying and getting cancer diagnoses um, on top of all of this. Yeah. Well, I've certainly heard a lot of uh, people talking about that, not only friends and family, but also podcasters that I listen to. It, it makes me wonder if it's a confluence of events or if people are just more able to voice these kinds of things that uh, frequently are happening anyway. But mm -hmm. with all the, the bad news uh, out there, it's like, well, you know, I guess I'm not spoiling the party if I'm adding to that bad news by talking about what's really happening all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've got clients that are disappearing because, you know, their parents are dying or they're getting chemo in the middle of this and they just can't deal with therapy right now. Um, yeah. I mean, people's lives are pretty full um, as it is. So yeah. So in a way my practice looks, the same and that I'm still seeing between 17 and 20 clients a week. Um, I'm doing it all on telehealth. It's really hard on my body. I've given up sitting in a chair at all and I have kind of like a pillow throne <laughs> sit in um, because my, I find that my body during the day needs like propping up and shifting and like I cannot sit in a chair. Um, the, our therapy is hard too, and I really miss that. I'm able to still do the sensory motor, but I'm doing very few clients I'm doing art with, although I am doing more guided meditations with people. Well, I mean, I, this is me, uh, that I, with some clients, with probably most and my supervisees, I will encourage them to do phone rather than video conferencing. Mm -hmm. I know that might sound kind of counterintuitive to some people because with video you have more information but I find that because I've been doing phone sessions you know very occasionally over the past 20 years for various reasons you know a client is out of town or something like that and I, I got used to phone sessions a long time ago it's a completely different form and definitely is in my view not as optimal as in person for sure but I don't know. I kind of got used to it. And I found that if you work it right, it can, it can provide new opportunities, you know, it's sort of like psychoanalytic work and that you can't see right, each other. It's very confessional. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, exactly. Up until whereas whereas video do. conferencing doesn't have that confessional uh, aspect to it. It, 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 and it's two dimensional and people are often kind of stuck right in front of some kind of weird position and there's no eye contact because you can't look at the person and at the camera at the same time. It, it, I mean, I definitely do video conferencing with some of my clients and supervisees, which is fine, but I'm just saying like, as you talk about your back hurting all day, I just wonder, I'm just throwing it out there. Like maybe some of them might be better off over the phone. I don't know. Well, and up until last week, uh, you could not bill insurance for a phone session. Right. I think you can right now, but also a lot of my clients want to see me. Like I'm realizing what a touchstone I am for some people. Well, yeah. I mean, you're their therapist. Come on. Right. Like seeing me and seeing that I'm okay is, you know, and, and a lot of them like really want to know right now, like, are you okay? <laughs> um, so that's been really interesting and i've definitely taken the feminist approach and the approach i'm taking on this podcast which is like i'll be honest with you i you know i'm i'm scared i'm overwhelmed i'm i'm tired sometimes i'm laughing <laughs> controllably at things that are so ridiculous <laughs> like my son you know and then like real life is occurring like of course the 
my subleaser who I love so much found a more beautiful space that's better for her. She's moving out. So like, and she's taking stuff with her. And like, so I have to get that stuff replaced. So, you know, I've been battling with Lowe's for like three weeks to try and get this refrigerator get brought to my office and I just can't make it happen. So Eli, my son and I decide we're going to go Lowe's ourselves and get the refrigerator and we get it and we load it in the car and we take off our masks and our gloves and we put hand sanitizer on and it's like super lemony flavored. And then the car becomes so toxic. <laughs> this lemon smell. <laughs> like we think we're going to die. And then we laugh for 15 minutes. You know, I mean, it's just like everything is like so hard right now and so ridiculous. Um, so I just, you know, I, I'm finding that I'm turning to humor a lot and that I just have to laugh through this. Yeah, I feel bad for everyone. I feel bad for you. Um, you were stressed out before this ever happened. And, uh, and this is kind of uh, predictably more stressful, right? Um, uh, for me, uh, I'm kind of a homebody anyway. And Stacy, you know, works from home sometimes anyway. So this, and I'm a germaphobe anyway. <laughs> and and uh, I don't like to commute uh, anyway. <laughs> and, and I'm also... I kind of like phone sessions to some extent. And so, uh, yeah, I, for me, it's uh, the, the big difference is I can't go out to eat every day like I usually do. <laughs> I usually go to the mm -hmm. market and get a big slice of pizza and a kale salad every day. Um, and my mouth is watering thinking about it. And I, that, that's, that's, <laughs> that, that's my big uh, a, sacrifice. A salad. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing actually, that now that I think about it, it's like, the total lack of vegetables in my life right now. Cause it just seems like mm -hmm. one of those things that's kind of hard to manage when you're quarantined, I suppose. But, but anyway, let's take a break and we get back. I have some more questions on Facebook for you. What do you say, Rebecca? Very good. All right. We're back from the break. If you haven't become a patron of the podcast yet, do so now go to patreon.com. That's how we know that you like this thing that we're doing. Also, if you're looking for an art therapist in Seattle, you can contact Rebecca by going where? Oh, um, my practice is full, um, but the Art Therapy Credentialing Board website has a list of all the art therapists all over the country. You could get one many, many places. So top fan Vanessa asks on Facebook, does Rebecca still shop at Walmart? like many people do despite the virus warning. I don't know what that means. I, I don't know if you had talked about shopping at Walmart before or if this is just a question about general shopping. people being out, out and about even though that they shouldn't be. So I have never shopped at Walmart uh, due to their labor practices. If you need to shop at Walmart, that's cool. But I personally choose not to shop at Walmart. But I, I, I've been limiting my shopping, and I'll say that the day that Jay Inslee put out the order, I did go to Rite Aid and buy a two-pound bag of M and M's. Um, so I, I love shopping. I love being the, the, the shopper for our family, and I will say that missing that kind of ritual of just popping into the store to get something that you need. Um, but I'm really limiting. I would say uh, like maybe once a week and I'll do the, I'm that crazy person in the mask. I was, um, it's interesting. I was in Whole Foods on the east side, right near where the center of the epidemic was here. Um, people have probably seen it in the news at an elder care facility where at least 35 people died from the virus. So I was like 10 minutes from there. I was the only person in the store with a mask on last week. I think that will change this week though. Um, yeah, so I'm going out, but it's super limited. Why were you going all the way out there? So it was my son and his girlfriend's one year anniversary. Um, and we made a, a special trip for social distancing, but so that they could see each other in person on that day. Oh, cute. Yeah heartbreaking did they blow lots of kisses it was very cute 
it was very heartbreaking. Yeah. And, you know, that's a date that we've been joking about making plans about for a long time. And to see what it ended up looking like on that day was like, this, this shit is real. <laughs> these, are, these are the memories that they'll have of this time. It's crazy. Yeah, it's funny. So, the, the older you get, the more you feel like you're living in history. Like mm-hmm. you, know, you keep saying like, this is going to be his AIDS crisis. This is going to, you know, the memories. I can't help but to see in 30 years when his generation starts to make movies. And you know mm-hmm. how like today you'll see movies about the 80s and the 90s. And, mm-hmm. you know, when we go to see those movies, we're like, oh, I remember that haircut. And mm-hmm. oh, I remember that TV show, like Stranger Things, for example. So in 30 years, there'll be, you know, someone from his generation will make some retro TV show and um, there will be, it'll be about this moment, you know, like Mm -hmm. um, a love story that happens and uh, you can't see each other during the um, coronavirus situation. And um, it'll all seem like this quaint thing that happened a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So Uh, you go to your Animal Crossing island and you need for a surprise yeah so yeah um so uh, a- anonymous patron asked how are you feeling about the virus in our society so i like many of you have been thinking about it nonstop. um i've you i worked at asian counseling referral service during the sars epidemic and had clients that were quarantined then and really saw the racism then. The staff, the Asian staff, if they left the agency, were asked to wear a mask. I was not asked if I, where my mask was when I left the agency. Um, so the intense racism towards Asian Americans right now is um, heartbreaking. Uh, I was a young gay adult at the height of the AIDS epidemic when we called Seattle Gay News, we just called the paper Who Died because you'd open it to see who died. Um, and I'm having like PTSD flashbacks now of like every day I go to the obituaries to see who died. Um, God, what else do I think? I feel yeah, like Bill Weathers up. died today. Not of, H- not of COVID. Right. Yeah. Um, right. But, you know, I, his music, oh my God, but the people who have died, I don't know. Uh, did we ever do an episode on um, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend? No, I haven't seen the show. Okay. Oh, God. It's amazing. So it, it's a show. It's a magical realism show where uh, they often break into song. And the songs are so profoundly funny. Um, and the big, the most well-known song from the show that they won an Emmy for was called like everybody's on antidepressants or something it's very very funny um but the songwriter it was adam uh, schlesinger who was in fountains of wayne um so the idea that like that music is over it's just kind of mind-blowing so he wrote all the music for that show he wrote a lot of it there were a lot of songs there were four seasons wow. at least one song a piece but it his i mean the songs were like poignant and funny he also did all the music for uh that thing you do i think he had an oscar nomination for that oh. and he won two grammys huh. or was nominated yeah I, that's interesting i'm so glad you're telling me this because when i saw the posts about him dying i the only thing i knew about him was that he was the the basis of that band that sang stacy's mom hmm. that and i have always hated that song. It's one of the most goof. It's it's like an era of rock music that just seems that just really grates on me. It's that sort of third eye blind uh, mm-hmm. late nineties era that, or that Blink One Eighty Two era that I and I know some people love those kinds of bands, but to me it just always felt like they were joking the whole time, which just doesn't do which it for they me. Were. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's like, okay, if I want Weird Al, I'll listen to Weird Al. But it seems like they were trying to be like one foot in Weird Al and one foot in Nirvana. And it just felt like it it didn't do it for me. So I was wondering, like, why is everyone caring about this? The bassist of this band that I barely remember for only one song. 
And then um, <clears throat> all these other posts started coming out about how fans of Wayne had a, more music. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe, you know, I just wasn't aware. But hearing this makes total sense that, that he was uh, contemporary. He was writing a beloved, he was writing music for a beloved uh, TV show, kind of like um, Brett from... Uh, found, uh, from uh, Flight of the Concords, for example, he's sort of behind the mm-hmm. scenes writing this music. So, um, yeah, okay, that makes sense. The name of the song is "Antidepressants Are Not a Big Are Not Are So Not a Big Deal." Um, and if you haven't heard the song, you should go track it down because it's hysterical, and you will get the sense. He also wrote the music for the amazing Stephen Colbert Christmas special, which is one of the funniest things I've ever seen that I hate Christmas. And it's one of the few Christmas specials that I really enjoyed. Uh, I think he won a Emmy for that one. Anyways, super amazing, talented person, only three years older than me. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, my own sense of grief and loss. It, so it's definitely reminds me of the AIDS epidemic where it's like, I don't have time to grieve what happened last week. <laughs> and now I'm having to grieve what happened this week. And I'm really overwhelmed. You know, and we're doing it collectively, but, you know, we can't do it together. I mean, I think it'll be interesting. One of the things I've been asking my clients is when, when this is over, what's the first thing you're going to go and do to make yourself feel like things are back to normal? Where's the first place you're going to go? Who's the first couple of people you're going to see? Um, and the answers that I've been getting are really, really interesting. Pizza and kale salad. That's my answer. What's your Is answer? Is that your answer? My, well, my, the vision I keep having, so the way I've been coping with the Trump administration is that I've been going to the Seattle Symphony a lot, sometimes once a month, uh, because it just carries me away to a different world. And that building, if you've never been in this space, it's so majestic. The entire, uh, amphitheater which sits 200 and 2500 people is the walls are made out of a single piece a single tree and and so it's just you know it's one of the most beautiful spaces in Seattle and I have a vision of like walking into the door and falling to my knees and crying so I got to go back in to that space yeah and actually the last time I was there I saw is it Rachel oh man uh she's the lead singer of um Lake Street Dive She's probably one of the best singers we have right now. And I saw her on her jazz tour in the small arena. Um, And it was was just a fantastic lighthearted show. So delightful. Such amazing acoustics. Yeah. So good to be out with friends. I dressed, I think I had a fancy top on. Maybe I had a hat. You know, all those little rituals that just, it's something to look forward to. It's, you know, and I think that's another level of grieving for me is like, um, <laughs> for the last thing I did in person with a group of people and we were all saying together, Oh my God, this might be the last time I'm with a group of people for a long time. Yeah. Along those lines, uh, that this is just my take on what's happening is that so right now and you know, three weeks ago, there was a certain risk of getting infected and spreading the virus. And the, the risk three weeks ago that necessitated everyone staying at home and all the measures that we're doing in, in Seattle is likely to persist probably until July. And then during maybe mid June or something, it'll be, uh, uh, the risk will be lower given the the amount of cases that is estimated and it's all estimate because we we can't test everyone like they can in other areas and so it's we just have to kind of base it on hospitalizations and deaths and the few people that we manage to test but anyway the but the risk won't go away then come the next flu season the next flu, cold and flu season in September October it's going to start all over oh, again Mark. Uh, right. Yeah. It, it's it's the and and in all likelihood, people will be more relaxed because half of the people are so stupid they can't uh, sort of manage the the probability and the risk. And 
they'll be like, well, I survived last time and everything was fine. So, you know, screw it. And this is what happened during the Spanish flu, which should be called the Kansas flu, as I always say, because it's most likely originated from Kansas. And do you know uh, why it's called the Spanish flu? Yeah. Well, I heard someone say that it's because during World War One, because Spain was neutral, they were more, they had a freer press and they yes. were reporting the deaths. And so it just looked right. like Spain was, um, you know, the, where it was, whereas the allies and Germany were um, not reporting anything because they didn't want to leak any kind of, um, in, you know, intelligence to the, <laughs> to the other side. But, but it seems to have originated from Kansas uh, in the, like in a military uh, area or something. But anyway, so um, the worry that I have is that it'll get even worse in the fall, or at least it'll be the same. So we're looking at, it, it, this is just me making an estimate that in Seattle mm-hmm. anyway, July, August through maybe September, we'll be able to live life as usual. But for another six months after that, we'll be in the same situation because the, mm-hmm. the vaccine isn't, if it ever comes out, will not come out for another year and a half, two years. And then you have to produce enough and then you have to get everyone to take it, which is a whole other thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, it, and it can't be a wrong vaccine because the coronavirus, novel coronavirus could mutate. It's not likely to mutate but it very well could. And then you just vaccined everyone for a strain of novel coronavirus that is no longer um, a problem. And there's this new one. So there's a chance, uh, I would say that uh, over the next year, that six to nine months out of that time, everyone's going to be stuck at home. And, yeah. you know, for a lot of people, and I, and, I, and I think the government and the experts don't want to say that because they don't want to freak everyone out. They don't want rioting in the streets. You know, they keep saying, okay, like the new thing is, uh, well, what, you know, May sometime, you know, everyone's stuck at home until mm-hmm. May and we'll reevaluate at some point. And it gives this impression like, oh, come May, we'll be okay. No, we won't. There's no, mm-hmm. there's no chance in hell that in Seattle in May, it'll be it'll be better. You know, the numbers Mm -hmm. are still going up in Seattle. We haven't reached the peak and the rest of the world and the rest of our country has definitely not missed, has definitely not hit the pink peak. And those people are free to travel to Seattle. So, Mm uh, I, I'm, you know, I don't know how you feel about (laughs) that. No, I mean, I, I worked in HIV AIDS. I actually worked at the health department before this and I, had the exact same scenario. I've been telling people the exact same scenario that yeah. until we have a vaccine for this virus, we will have periods of isolation through this because there's no other way to protect ourselves. And I've been, are you talking to anyone in any countries that's reached the peak going through it, like in Singapore or South Korea? No. Okay. So I've been talking to Guy Young every week and, um, South Korean culture has opened back up slowly, but she sees clients in person with a mask on. Everyone wears masks all the time. When you go into a grocery store, they hand you a fresh pair of gloves to use while you're in the grocery store. Um, You know, so they're proceeding uh, with universal precautions on all the time. And I think that's what it's going to look like. You know, I'm very curious what travel... uh, well, you know, will we ever travel again until there's a vaccine? I don't know. Well, I feel safe traveling again. I love traveling. Would I feel safe traveling right now? Probably not. Um, so I think there's, there are those kinds of huge impacts. Yeah. Side note, this year was going to be my travel year. I would, mm. I had all these little trips planned. Um, mm-hmm. I, I luckily got two of them out of the way, Mardi Gras, ironically, while coronavirus, um, and luckily, you know, didn't uh, get infected, being pressed up against all those people on Bourbon Street, and then went to Lake Tahoe uh, the weekend before they shut everything down um, mm-hmm. for, for skiing, which, which was great. And the, um, in fact, when I went to the airport to go to Lake Tahoe, 
I had already been self isolating for like 10 days and it was really weird to just see human beings, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, anyway, so, and so I was going to, Stacy and I were going to go to New York because she owns a spa in Manhattan and she was going to do this training. And so we were going to spend some extra days like going to Broadway and going to see comedy and that's all off. My niece gradu- was gradu- is graduating from pharmacy school. And so I was going to go to her graduation in Minnesota. Um, Stacy and I were going to go to the Ascension in New Mexico, which is the, it's the mass uh, ascending of all the hot air balloons. There's like oh yeah, hundreds yeah. and hundreds of, at the same time. And I, I've actually been to it before, but it's been a while and Stacy's never been. And, and so we are going to go to like arches and the Grand Canyon and, and all that stuff. And, and I'm pretty sure that's off of the table as well. Um, what else was I going to do? There's, there's another, oh, I wanted to go to... Um, well, you know, we still might anyway, there's other trips and it, it, I was looking forward to this year. I was like, oh man, I'm going on all these trips. I even got like the, the Nexus pass and, or not Nexus, <laughs> but the, the, the pre, you know, okay. TSA pre-check. Right. Right. And, yeah. and, you know, I was like, okay, you know, cause I, I, in my life, I haven't actually traveled that much um, because my family wasn't a very traveling family and um, I've man, never. Four kids, three, four kids. Yeah, four again. kids. Well, and the other issue was they both grew up in Spokane, Washington, which is where all their family lived and stayed. Mm-hmm. And so whenever they had vacation, that's where we went. We went to Spokane mm-hmm. for a week or two, which was always a great, great time. And I loved it, but it was just, you know, a, a six hour car ride. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> With your siblings. Yeah. Well, so a yeah. so side note on that side note was, my, you know, <laughs> when my parents were young and poor, they had two cars and one of them was a, a small Datsun truck purple and with this really rickety, in the back. Yes. So, oh. but there was a canopy. So, oh, <laughs> uh, but it was a very rickety, you know, plywood <laughs> canopy that probably someone just made in their backyard. And oh my God. yeah, the four of us kids, would ride in the back and and this is at a time when they didn't have the sliding window so you couldn't even we couldn't even communicate with our parents um and it would get real hot you know because eastern washington this is your movie right here yeah yeah uh you know i was probably four years old no car seat you know no sitting on the wheel well right absolutely yeah not even those you know because today they have those plastic bed oh no Right. Yeah, this yeah. is just sheet metal in the back of a of a. Oh of yeah, a I can rusty see it exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the saving grace is my mom would uh, make sushi, and so we'd have a Tupperware of of sushi. Pro- we probably didn't have anything to drink because you know <laughs> you're old enough to you know we're the same age in the seventies. Yeah. Um, one, no one cared about hydration, and two, <laughs> there was no portable hydration. A thing no. so today it's like maybe you had bottled maybe, water maybe somebody had been a boy scout and they had that kind of bladder leather thing and then the water tasted like leather and you had to shoot it into each other's mouths and miss do you remember those oh yeah well our usage for those was bringing booze up to the ski slopes in, mm-hmm. the, in the 80s um that was that mm-hmm. was the boda bag but no, no one, no one could afford such extravagance. Um, REI didn't exist. And so I'm pretty sure that we had no, uh, you know, hydration on this five hour, six hour, 120 degree trip. In, in the canopy. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyway, I don't know how we got on that, on that. So there's one thing I want to talk about. Please. Uh, thinking about how this will impact society. And it came out this morning with my wife and we've been talking a lot about do we go buy our own groceries we've been paying for a service that delivers our groceries i've been starting to feel guilty about this and so i sang to her the sweet honey and the rock song more than a paycheck do you know that song no so do you know who sweet honey and the rock is no okay so sweet honey and the rock is a group uh it's a uh it was founded by Bernice Johnson Reagan, Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan, and it was a group of six to eight African-American women 
It was an acapella group. They always had an ASL interpreter who was part of the group, and they sang political songs, and um, they used to travel, and they were well-known in the social justice communities, and they had many amazing songs, um, and they wrote a lot of their own songs, and they had this one song called More Than a Paycheck, which is about the history of low-income workers around the world, and I cannot sing but the idea, I'm just going to say the words, um, we bring more than a paycheck to our loved ones and family. We bring asbestosis, silomatosis, brown lung, black lung disease, and the radiation hits the children before they've even been conceived. Um, and so the whole song is about the perils of low-income workers in our communities and around the world, and this idea that right now... <laughs> the people that we need most are not making a living wage and have to keep working to keep their health insurance. Um, I hope is one of the things that will change as we come out of this. Um, you know, when your life is hanging in the balance and the person that's serving you, if they're lucky is making $15 an hour, that's our society's pretty screwed at that point. Um, and so I think like the idea of who really matters in our culture is something I hope we really look at through this. Yeah, I doubt that our society will. I, I imagine that Seattle might have a better chance. We passed a $15, uh, you know, minimum wage, which I was surprised passed, by the way. Um, but uh, so there seems to be a understanding of a certain level in Seattle. At the very least, the uh, protections for them so that they don't get sick. Uh, I saw right. a report recently of a man who, uh, he posted a thing on YouTube or something of him, he was a bus driver and a public metro driver somewhere in the United States. And he, he's talking into his phone and he's like, okay, people, someone was just coughing on my bus without covering their mouth and he, he goes on for a long time it's just like you know you gotta do what you can i i'm stuck on this bus i mm -hmm. i have to get people to where they're going and so you need to do your part this was like a week and a half ago or something well he died mm -hmm. like not Gosh. long after that yeah from coronavirus and <sighs> it's unclear obviously if it was from that person but it certainly is a suspicion and it's things like that. Whereas, uh, and I was, it was on Reddit and I, I was sort of scrolling through the comments and someone said in their country, in somewhere in Asia, or maybe it was Poland or something, the, they e immediately constructed these protecting, protective areas for the bus drivers so that the passengers would be less likely to infect the bus driver. And mm -hmm. We live, I just, you know, I, I'm ranting about this all the time on the podcast and otherwise, that we live in the most advanced society, the most richest society that has ever existed, potentially in the universe, because, you know, we don't know about the other life forms, and at least on this planet. And we have the means, we have right. the power, we have the know-how. We have, I mean, at the very least, just get some garbage bags and with some duct tape and allow people to construct their own situation. And we just don't because yeah. why, you know, because we don't care about people that are working class or that have certain kinds of jobs. Um, you know, like for, for you and me, we have the luxury and the privilege to just stay home and, and we continue to get paid and we continue to do our work and it's inconvenient, but I can't imagine it's going like shit. Well, you know, got to work nine to five, walking out the door um, around all these other yahoos and they're coughing in my face. I hope I don't die, uh, uh, but I don't have any other choice because I have to pay my rent. I, as you know, as you say, it's, it's, it's ridiculous and obvious. And if those, if working class people had the power that they should have in our society, um, things would change, but, uh, but they don't. And so we all have to do what we can to, uh, you know, raise awareness and to, 
the key here is one advocacy, but two also voting people. That's, that's, a, that's what I keep trying to uh, hammer home of like representatives represent and they represent the will of their constituents, not necessarily of the people, but of the people who voted for them. And so we have to vote for people that talk about the things that are important and um, and we shouldn't be focused on the silly things. And I hope that through this crisis, there's some realignment of our priorities here. Um, you know, what, what does it matter? There, there's so many things, you know, when we look, when I think back at all the political scandals of, of the, whether it was sexual or something else of the past, you know, five years, think, you know, things that pop into mind are, you know, some politician makes it illegal to sell big gulps in New York city or something. <laughs> and that became the political story f- for a month. Who the fuck cares? I mean, on the grand scheme <laughs> of things, oh, you know, you know, okay, fine. I guess everyone can have an opinion about a big, you know, a 64 ounce big gulp, but let's, let's realign our priorities here. Let's, let's, let's quickly move on from that and on to these more important things. Climate change is a billion times more important than the coronavirus is uh, because the coronavirus is terrible, but climate change is, is going to kill everything, not just humans. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and so, and is killing everything, not, uh, not just humans. So uh, uh, our whole civilization could crumble in a hundred years uh, because of our stupidity and not, and not voting with our minds. Um, so uh, I hope that happens, but you know, Rebecca, honestly, in three years, I have, I have no doubt that things will look exactly the same net, uh, in three years as they did a year ago, and this will just blow past. It'll be like, oh, you know, like Y two K. It'll be like, remember that uh-huh. thing that happened a long time ago? Uh, you know, during the HIV crisis, there was talk about like, well, maybe this will help us as a society to be more human, to be more caring, to be more present, to realign our, uh, our you know, priorities, especially when people like Magic Johnson and non-oppressed uh, people started to uh, come down with HIV. It's like, okay, this is, this is our problem. This is everyone's problem. And let's all pull together the big quilt, all this kind of stuff. And it's like, you know, did that bear out? Did did in you know 2016? Did we see this you know furthering of humanity? I, I don't know, Rebecca. Yet, pull me back from right, the cliff me, here. Am right, I, here, let me let me. Uh, Mama's here to help you out a little bit. Um, you know there are tons of things that didn't change because of HIV/AIDS, but gay marriage is something that I didn't think I was going to see in my lifetime, and it's because of the AIDS epidemic um, that gay marriage happened. More gay people came out, more people knew a gay person, more people lost a gay person, more people realized there was nothing to be scared of, of gay people. Um, So sometimes, you know, we don't know what the long-term impact, and if you were to tell me at the height of the AIDS epidemic, what's going to come out of this is a lot of gay families are going to be able to live really openly I would have been like whatever and that's not something I need um but that's what if you ask me that's what came out of it so yeah I don't think we're gonna you know we may not know it may not be the thing that we wanted um but there's no way this isn't going to impact the world so we'll just have to wait and see and what's funny is I'm usually the pessimist and you're the optimist. So it's interesting. I mean, I'm optimistic about a a lot of things, but uh, I I guess I'm, I mean, pessimistic is one way of putting it. Another one, I guess, cynical or something. Uh, We've always- Return from the dark side. (laughs) We've always as a society just been fairly, I always use the word stupid, but another way to put it is just like short-sighted, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't doubt that that short sightedness will will continue. Uh, like the um, 
massive amount of homophobia that is still present in our society in, in 2020 uh, is a counterpoint, I suppose, you know, that politicians can be openly homophobic these days uh, would, I think, surprise. Uh, it would, you know, in during the HIV epidemic, if you would have said, you know, in 2020, gay marriage will be legalized in the United States and for the most part, uh, totally accepted. Uh, but there will still be massive homophobia. I'd be like, well, that you have that backwards. You know what I mean? I, I would have mm. said, well, homophobia sh- should surely be gone by 2020. I mean, uh, that's like Star Trek times, you know, like, come on. <laughs> um, but yeah, gay marriage legalized. Yeah, that's going to be a tough one. Like I, I would have thought it would have been reversed. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. know if that makes any sense, but yeah. 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 So I, I are you... You know, this is my last question to you. You know, you've talked about the stress. You've talked about the impact on your life. Uh, are you lying awake at night, staring into the darkness? Are Are you personally freaking out? Yes and no. So I saw the one question I saw that was going to be asked for me that I prepared for was how much time should we spend thinking about this? Um, and so I'm like probably everyone else. I'm checking the New York Times in the Seattle Times way too often. <laughs> I've learned like three weeks ago that, you know, there's no big news coming. Like there's no answer coming, but I still habitually check. Um, yes, there's nights that I've cried myself to sleep, overwhelmed with, you know, that I know people that are still delivering packages and have to for their livelihoods. I know people, I can't see my own parents uh, yeah, so, and um, I just want to say, so there was this great post from um, Mental Health America, and they've teamed up with this woman, Gemma Carroll, who's this great graphic illustrator, and they have the six mental health care bears, um, I think for mental health in general, but I'm calling them mental health of care bears of the apocalypse, and they were, it was humor, life-work balance, animal connection spirituality oh there were two more um social connection and one more and so i've just tried to make sure that as often as i can one of those is coming true and i realized like humor is number one for me um i'm laughing when i shouldn't be laughing I'm trying to make other people laugh. I'm really choosing to only hang out with people that make me laugh. Um, Because that's, I realized like in the apocalypse, that's what I need. How about for you? Have you found that there's like one thing that besides drugs and alcohol, which are up 50%, um, have you found that there's one helpful coping strategy that you need these days? I guess, I mean, there's so many things I could say, but I guess the primary thing that I'm doing is I'm just resolving that I'm never leaving the house for the next five years. Um, And I know that's not as poetic and uh, pleasing as the Care Bears of the Apocalypse, but (laughs) for me, um, I I have that privilege. And and I guess more to my extension, the podcast has been a huge thing for me. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm, I, I guess... It's interesting. I I, th- I think I had a, a fleeting conscious awareness of this, but now it's like coming into sharp fo- focus as you ask me this question. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the podcast is my coping mechanism. Mm-hmm. I can talk with people, you know, like you and other people close to me. We can vent. Um, I'm in conversation with the listeners because they ask questions and they'll email stuff. And um, so I feel very connected in that way. And it's, and it's, it's, I feel like I'm doing something, you know, I feel like, Mm -hmm. okay, this is what I can do. Um, I can, I can do this. And, um, and I'm sort of worried because I've stockpiled like a lot of episodes. Mm. (laughs) Like I, like I, like I could probably not do an episode for the next two months and be okay because Mm -hmm. I've stockpiled so many episodes that eventually it'll become uh, not a, a good idea to keep recording episodes and uh, at, what am I going to do at that point <laughs> um, mm-hmm. is, is and actually uh, 
you and I talking right now is sort of like the end of this huge wave of podcasts I've been doing over the past few weeks. And so after you and I stop recording today, I'm going to be to some extent a little bit, uh, you know, I have to shift gears somehow. And I, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll start working on some deep dives or some, you know, some kind of research thing. So that's what I've been doing. I've just been um, distracting myself through that. Also with frivolous things, I guess with humor, like you're saying, like I'm doing reaction videos on YouTube now. Of, oh, you are? Yeah. Like I did one for Tiger King. Have you seen that documentary? Oh, yes. And Love is Blind. That. Have you seen that? I uh, know. <laughs> but I would watch your reaction video. I don't want to yeah. personally have to witness what happens on that show. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe more reaction videos. Like I heard that 90 Day Fiance is uh, reactionable. I've heard that there's some other uh, TV shows that can you know I can react to. And I, I thought about actually doing different reaction videos just to various depictions of therapy in movies and TV shows, you know? Yes, and I'd um, like to be on that with you. Cool. I, that's something that I've wanted to do for a long time. Right? Because there's so many mm -hmm. depictions and most of them are just terrible. It's horrible. Yeah. I actually wanted that to be a feature of the podcasting that we did, where we, we yeah. did supervision for TV therapists. I yeah. thought that would be an excellent use of our skills. Yeah. So the final, final question I have for you, Rebecca, as a, as a Jewish person yourself, mm. the Jewish people have been through a lot. And if there's a, a, a culture that can tell us mm. how we should all persevere, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. got to be the it's got to be the Jews, right? Mm -hmm. um, We're and ready. The religion, in my perception, is you know largely based on the suffering of the people mm -hmm. and the, the persevering Preach. through you know through the desert forty days and forty or forty years, right? So. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us all? Mm, thank you. So I, I've been returning a lot to Jewish learning through this. I'm taking a Jewish meditation class right now. And it was, we're focused on jo uh, Jacob's Ladder right now. And the idea of basically your body being a conduit um, to the divine. And so just in a meditation practice of, um, straightening your body has been really grounding to me. I can't stay in meditation these days. Um, but I'm, so I would say that there's a big portion of, there's no heaven in Judaism. All you have is the present moment. And so whatever you can do to uh, make the present moment as good as it can be. And you see that, um, through stories of what people did through the Holocaust um, in whatever way you can to keep the rituals that you have alive. And a lot of people are turning to Zoom to do that or even sitting out in the street and sharing your music with people or dancing in the streets or chalk art in the streets. And um, that act, um, it's called Takun Alam, uh, to leave the world a better place than you found it. So that, that act of service part is incredibly important. I could just tell me when to shut up because <laughs> I can go on this subject for a very, very long time. So it sounds um, like through action, that's the... Yes. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Judaism is an active... It's not a sit back and wait for someone else to do it. Judaism, at least the way that I grew up in Jewish renewal very specifically Northern California, Jewish renewal. Um, you are an active participant in both your own life, in your relationship with God. And however you see that, if that means going outside right now or hugging a tree or writing someone that you love and telling them that you love them, um, Judaism is super active. But I think it's really interesting. I'm about to, we're about to do a Passover Seder we're about to try and negotiate the first major holiday in social isolation. And Passover is about gathering together and telling the story of Exodus. And so I would be fascinated to podcast after that of like how, how we saw the Exodus in these times 
Um, Because that's the amazing thing about Judaism is that you return to these stories every year and you have a fresh view of these six, seven thousand year old stories. You you find new meaning in them every year. Does it help Um, to know that your people have survived various crises over the eons? Oh, yes. Yes. And there are endless, so the, can I teach everyone something right now? Yeah. Okay. Um, So I'm going to talk you guys through the Shema. Uh, So the the central prayer in Judaism is the Shema. Uh, Traditionally, it would be said, I think, like seven times a day, much like Muslims pray seven times a day. Um, And really, all that you're saying is uh, the Lord here the Lord is one, I am one with the Lord. Um, and you could take that to mean anything. In my practice, it's really like I am, I am one with all things and that oneness holds me. And in the first truly religious experience I ever had um, was saying this prayer that I'd said constantly throughout my life, but saying each with one breath, each word with one breath. So if I could teach anybody anything today it's take a phrase that has meaning to you and just slow it down and just give intention to each word so it's breathing in shma israel adonai eloheinu Adonai, Ehad. So if you could slow down that thing that is rote, that once had meaning, and find meaning in it again, um, you, you've truly done a mitzvah, an act of service for yourself. And I think that Judaism, because we've been on the run, for so long and you know during the middle ages the jews were blamed for the plague i mean that's why the inquisitions happened in spain like you know we've been on the other side of this many many times and been told like you 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 personally will not survive until the next year and yet we have so um that both cultural faith and and religious stories you know uh, people a large percentage of us are going to survive this. You know, 6 million Jews died in the Holocaust along with prostitutes and gay men and Jews and Romani people and Catholics and priests. And yet all of those things still survive to this day. Like, you know, that's a miracle. So um, I know a lot of people their faith is really being shaken right now. Mine is often <laughs> shaken to the ground right now. But to know we've, throughout human history, we've survived so many plagues, so many. Um, you know, during the Black Plague, half of the European population died. And yet human history went on, like, you know, we're going to make it through this. It might not look like anything you ever imagined, but we're going to make it through. Well, on that note, let's do our, <laughs> let's do our send off in that, oh. in that form. So everyone in take care of yourself because why Rebecca? Because I'm here for you. I'm Phyllis Kirk.